we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today as we highlight the PACT Act and how this new law will provide generations of veterans and their survivors with the VA care and benefits they've earned. It's good to be joined by the Executive Director of the White River Junction VA, Becky Rhodes, General Knight, members of the Veterans Advisory Council, and legislators to help raise awareness of the PACT Act. Director Rhodes will go into more specifics about the act itself and who qualifies, but in short, the law is meant to help veterans who were exposed to burn pits and other toxins while serving our country. I want to thank our congressional delegation for their work on this bill, but most importantly, I want to acknowledge June Heston, who is here with us today, for her efforts on behalf of our veterans at both the state and federal level, making sure they get the care they deserve. As you know, June was a strong advocate in 2019 when we enacted a first in the nation burn pit registry, and she didn't stop there. She and other advocates kept pushing to get the PACT Act signed into law, and it wouldn't have happened without her. So I, uh, I thank her for that. Those who serve our country give so much for all of us. They put their lives on the line to keep us safe here at home. I think we can all agree the least we can do as a country is to ensure that once they return, they get the care they need. The PACT Act is designed to help protect veterans against things we don't see. When we think of uh, sacrifice, I often think about people like my dad. Um, as many of you know, he served in World War II as a tank operator and came home a double amputee. The VA was there for my dad and people like him who came back with visible physical injuries as a result of their service. But the PACT Act makes sure that those who were exposed to chemicals that cause cancer and other hidden illnesses get care as well. That's why it's important for veterans to learn more about these benefits in places where they might have been exposed to burn pits and other chemicals that cause serious health problems later in life like cancer. So it's important to identify them as early as possible. As you'll hear next from Director Rhodes, there are time limits for some to enroll, so please don't wait. And if you have questions, we're here to help. So with that, I'd like to turn over to Director Rhodes. Thank you, Governor Scott, for inviting us here and for supporting our military community. As Governor Scott mentioned, the Sergeant First Class Heath Robinson, honoring our promise to address comprehensive toxic acts, the PACT Act of 2022 is a new law. It expands VA healthcare and benefits for all veterans exposed to top toxic substances and burn pits. It's one of the largest health and benefit expansions in American history. The PACT Act expands and extends eligibility for VA healthcare for veterans with toxic exposures and veterans from the Vietnam era, the Gulf War era, including Desert Storm, and post 9-11 era. This law recognizes that toxic exposure is a cost of war and allows us in VA to address the full range of issues that impact toxic exposed veterans. We want to reach as many veterans and service members as possible and encourage them to enroll for VA healthcare. For those veterans and service members that already receive their health care through the VA, we want to make sure they know about the expanded benefits that are available under the PACT Act. As of last week, VA had received over 260,000 PACT-related claims and performed over 1 million toxic exposure screenings from around the country. We want to make sure that Vermont veterans and service members know what is available to them and what they are eligible for. On Saturday, February 25th, the Vermont National Guard and Governor Scott have made it possible for us to hold a VA claim assistance and toxic exposure screening clinic at Camp Johnson in Colchester. We will have staff on hand to process benefit claims, perform toxic exposure screenings, and answer any questions. Today, we will sign a letter that outlines the importance of the PACT Act and invites the military community to attend this event. General Knight, once again, thank you for hosting us at Camp Johnson. And Governor Scott, thank you for prioritizing Vermont veterans and service members today and into the future. I'm going to turn it over to General Knight. Thank you, Dr. Before General Knight starts, have people come in um, if you'd like to.
So Governor Scott, thank you, sir, uh, for your ongoing support of our veterans. Um, and certainly exemplified by what we're doing here today. Dr. Rhodes, thank you uh, for being here uh, as the lead representative for what in my view is probably the best uh, VA uh, clinic in the United States. We've got it pretty good here. Look, the PACT Act is, is important. Um, we've been pretty diligent as a guard getting the word out, uh, starting with the burn pit registry. Uh, it's passed into law here, uh, working with all interested agencies to get the word out to our veterans and uh, we've grown that number by three times, and that's important uh, for the VA so they can continue uh, providing services to our veterans as well as continue their data analysis and research required um, to continue this process. PACT Act is gonna be important. Obviously, the, the most frustrating thing for me is knowing the challenge it takes to reach the veterans that we need to reach when they separate from the service. Um, we can reach the ones that we know of when they retire they leave Vermont, uh, they go elsewhere, and we simply lose track of them. Um, they certainly don't report back to us. So that's why this event is very important. Uh, we'll push it out on all of our social media and reach as many veterans as we can uh, to get in here, get their screening, um, enroll in the VA healthcare system. And, and the governor is absolutely right. Uh, these are invisible wounds. And what's happening today, what's true today, may not be true tomorrow. So it's important to reach all of our veterans. But uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. And a special thanks to our congressional delegation for uh, working so diligently to get this done. Thanks. All right, we'll open up to questions at this point. There's maybe a question about the capacity <clears throat> to serve healthcare to some of these Vermonters who have been exposed. What has been done or what is being done um, within Vermont's medical community to meet that, that need? Because you said 200,000, that's uh, pretty significant. Maybe Director Rhodes. Yes. Sure. The 200,000, um, that's across the country, and um, those are claims. So it's important to note we talked about the burn pit registry. Registering on the burn pit registry is separate from filing claim through the Vermont the Veterans Benefits Association um, so administration. So if you need, if you are on the burn pit registry, there's, that's a separate and different thing from filing a claim. So a claim for benefits is the thing that then allows us to provide health care. So through the benefits arm. So that's where all of those claims are coming. That's the new sort of part one is the VBA claims. Part two is the delivery of health care. We are certainly um, primed and ready in White River Junction and across the country to handle what's coming in. Um, as we've talked about, some of these are invisible and some of them are um, over time. And so there may not be a presentation today, but at least we can monitor, track, and be aware of warning signs um, for the future for healthcare we may need to provide that maybe isn't, isn't needed today. Do we have a sense of how many Vermont veterans may have uh, participated in these conflicts and may be eligible for, for these benefits? <coughs> So if you go back over the past two decades and all the combined deployments between the Air and Army National Guard here in Vermont, that number is easily in the thousands. We can certainly get you a more refined number. Uh, but again, that's the ones we know of. Uh, when they separate from the service, either as a first-term member, they could do their six-year commitment and depart the service, or if they retire, uh, we will lose track of them. I think it's also important to note uh, this isn't confined uh, to the Middle East. Uh, I believe that uh, Agent Orange is also uh, included in this on this list. So for those who served in Vietnam uh, as Chris, well, yes. did you want to just? So I, I'm going to kind of follow up on your question. Um, so I'm Bob Burke, Director of Veterans Affairs for the state. So it's similar to the governor's challenge to reduce veteran suicide, right? For private providers, it's ask the question, have you ever served, right? Not were you in the military, are you a veteran? Right, very simple, have you ever served, right? And then start breaking it down from there, right? Peel the onion back and find out, oh yeah, I did serve. Oh, did you serve? Where did you serve? Oh, I served in an area, you know, X, Y, Z. And so it's informing and educating private providers that those are some questions and, and some things that you need to dig into. You, you talked about the screening. Um, are you talking about a medical screening that's for pathologies, or are you talking about screening people to get a sense of whether or not they might have been in a place where they could have been exposed? 
the latter. So it's a screening. It can be done, um, the initial screening, and there are triggers in the initial screening that prompt more thorough physical and other, um, a much deeper dive in if you screen, essentially screen positive for answering some of the, some of the questions. So that's what's happening. We have two um, licensed independent providers perverting, performing those screenings right now for anyone that wants them um, and have been doing that this fall. And then any of those that prompt um, sort of a, a yes trigger to that is a more in-depth investigation into more questions and um, can generate other tests and other follow-up based on their responses. And would uh, a medical intervention have to wait until somebody is showing symptoms consistent with experimental exposure, or are there things that can be done on the medical side in advance of that to either minimize the chance that those symptoms show up or I'm definitely not a medical doctor, um, so I don't have expertise in that particular area, but my understanding is all of this is that the because of things like the burn print registry, we know um, warning signs, all the research that happens within VA, we know um, groups of symptoms that may be indicative of X that prompt other treatment, and again, um, those private providers sending people to the VA for these toxic exposure screenings so that they're in our system and you have providers and physicians that are familiar with um, what we're talking about here. They do it all the time every day. So um, getting them into the VA system is important to help get that get that health care. But it's not that you have to wait until, you know, just like preventative health care, that's what we're trying to do all the time so that we don't end up, um, you know, with a bad outcome. How, how are the outcomes for people that do get early treatment? I don't know the... I'm not sure I can speak on you know specifics. It's very independent based on what what was the exposure, when are they coming to us? Um, is it early? Is it is it late? Um, but I think that would be a very individual question based on the individual person, their exposures, their general medical history, et cetera. With that process being said and the, the numbers that have been mentioned, how um, prepared is the VA to handle the, the influx of Right now, um, we have a representative from VBA here. The primary influx is to VBA for claims. Once someone gets a service connection um, through that process, that's when they would transition that to the Veterans Health Administration and VA hospitals. We've seen, um, again, with our, I have the number exactly, that we've done um, toxic exposure screenings in the last three months is 1,700, which is way more than we'd ever done. If you look at that, you know, annualize that, way more than we've done in the past. Um, but the transition from claim to healthcare, that's the bolus that hasn't hit us yet. That's in, in the VBA claims process right now. Are you guys confident that you'll be able to handle that? Absolutely. That's our, our anticipated when we're, we're trying to staff all the clinics appropriately, both on the side of folks that are trying to get into the system, so on the eligibility side, registering for VA care. We don't want their first experience to be that we don't call them back, we don't answer the phone. Um, we want people to come to the VA. We want to see them for their health care on the, on the back side of the claims, or if they're just interested in getting into the VA system on the front end. General Knight, other big reforms that you're looking for um, as it relates to the care that your members get from the VA? Uh, I think probably the most important thing, as Becky said, we've got a, a very good system here in Vermont. Um, the bigger concern for me, I will come back to it again, uh, because it is important, is, is getting the word out to those veterans who have been deployed in areas where maybe of concern for exposure to toxins. Uh, my big concern is once somebody separates from the service, as I said, we don't have track of them, but they also may not connect an ailment with exposure to burn pits. And the further the distance between the two events, um, and again, it comes back to what the governor said, it's invisible now. If you do the screening, you're far more likely, and I say this not being a doctor by any stretch, but you're far more likely to find something early and be able to get the treatment once you're enrolled in the VA system. I think we probably all know uh, someone who's served and done tours, multiple tours uh, in the Middle East in particular. Um, I think about uh, Mike Cram, uh, for instance. Uh, I went to visit him with General Heston um, about a week before uh, Mike Cram passed away. Had we had this registry uh, before then, um, maybe uh, that this would have been identified with people like Mike Cram. 
uh, not long after that, um, General Heston passed away uh, due to cancer. Uh, same issue there. So trying to get this registry um, so that we know who they are, where they are, so they're getting uh, screened is really a matter of life and death at, at times. So I think this is uh, very important. I also had a, a cousin who was in Vietnam, uh, lived in Barrie, and he passed away uh, due, to, due to cancer. And I'm sure, we were all sure, uh, that it was due to Agent Orange. And, um, but it was never proven. Um, that wasn't uh, viable at that point in time. But today, again, having this registry uh, will give everyone an opportunity to at least get on this registry so we know who they are, where they are, and get them the help that they deserve um, from service to their country. <coughs> Any other questions on this topic? We have a number of veterans here in the room. Um, we have a number of active duty here as well. Um, maybe you want to ask them about uh, their thoughts on, on the uh, reduction of the tax on military pensions or something like that. <laughs> Speaking of. All those in favor? <laughs> uh, just to bring up budget and fiscal issues. Um, the House wants to spend $21 million to extend the Hotel Motel program as is until July 1st. They said they want time, more time to put in a plan for what's going to happen to those folks when they leave those units. Uh, your, your thoughts on that? Proposal? Yeah, I mean, we have a plan uh, that we put forth, so we have a, a plan for that. Uh, and uh, some of it that we've, we've been talking about, some of it will be in the budget itself, um, but trying to get them into permanent housing is important. I'm also a little concerned about that. I think it's 86 or 87 million in total. Um, very pleased, uh, by the way, uh, with them including uh, our initiatives in that uh, budget adjustment. Um, but I'm concerned about the 86, 87 million dollars more they added and where that's going to come from. Um, because obviously um, we have a budget uh, that includes a lot of that money and uh, I just want to make sure that we continue to focus on the fundamentals and what can help us get through the next few years as we see the, the economy uh, turn downward, I believe. So are you opposed to spending an additional $21 million? I don't know that it's needed. I think it should be something we, we discuss, but, uh, but I think we have a plan in place right now. Um, they've fenced off, as Representative Lambert said, the $9 million in the U.S. for, for site beds down south. Um, but they said they're not ready to appropriate that money until they can learn more about sure. what it is the hospital is going to do. That makes sense. Exactly. You're right. okay with yes. That? Yeah. Governor, the, the federal government is ending its nationwide COVID emergency declaration. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's in May. Is that? Yeah. I, b I believe I, I heard that last night uh, that they made that declaration. So I think it's just a sign of where we are uh, at this point in time. Uh, we've been through a lot over the last two or three years, and uh, COVID is still uh, among us, uh, but, uh, but it isn't at the emergency level. So I think it's, uh, it's probably appropriate. So you would agree with the decision? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my understanding is that this could have implications for insurance coverage of vaccines and testing. Um, are you concerned about how that could affect well, well, again, I mean, this is going to be as common as the flu as time goes on. I mean, we've gone through this emergency. Um, the vaccine uh, we have is uh, viable, and uh, it'll become just like we do with the normal flu. Um, I believe that you'll have to have a COVID uh, booster on a yearly basis of some sort. Um, so I think, again, uh, this is appropriate, and we've been through this uh, for a while, and it's just going to become a part of our everyday uh, challenges. The rolling back of the emergency also means rolling back some regulations surrounding telehealth, especially. Um, in a rural state like Vermont, what, what impact do you think that, that could have? Well, telehealth has become uh, very central uh, to what we do, and I think it's been, been viable. Um, we'll see where we're at with that and what we need to supplement that, but, but I think it's become um, effective. And, and in terms of, I don't know if I'd describe it as rolling back, but you know, the, the emergency uh, has 
has been subsiding uh, for quite some time. We're not seeing anyone attesting to the degree we had like a year or two ago. Uh, in fact, it's almost non-existent at this point in time. So uh, again, we need to get back to somewhat normal, and this will be part of normal. Well, again, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens on a, on a federal level. Um, we already uh, have uh, assistance for flu shots and so forth. So again, it's covered under, under uh, regular insurance. So I would, I would say that it's going to be included in some capacity in the future. Also this week, um, the House and Senate are continuing testimony on uh, the abortion shield law. Um, I know last week you said in principle or in theory it would be something that, that you eventually support. Have you gotten a chance to, to look at the bill? I haven't looked at the bill, um, and I know it's being worked on, but I, I feel the same way. Um, from what I've heard over the last week or so, um, I'm generally in favor, but details matter. The, the Senate bill, S-37, it includes a provision in it um, basically What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think we're getting too far in the weeds from my expertise. Um, so I would want to confer with my, my team uh, to see what they think about this and what the ramifications are of this as well before I jump into the, to the fray. Governor, in both of your addresses so far throughout the session, you've mentioned uh, mental health services and things like that. So there's a bill going around the House that would essentially add Vermont to an interstate counseling compact. Would you be in support of possibly joining an interstate compact so we can have more doctors come in to improve, I guess, the services and care of mental health across the state? Well, in, in concept, I would say the more we can do as a region, the better. Um, I'm not sure, again, the ramifications of that, and I'd want to talk to my health care team to see if this is uh, good for Vermont or not. And, uh, with some of the extreme weather coming in later on in the week and the end of the weekend, are any state agencies planning on doing anything to prepare for that? Yeah, interestingly enough, I, I did uh, speak to the cabinet this morning. We had our weekly cabinet meeting, and I brought that up um, and advocated it's going to be a you know, this, we've been spoiled in some respects uh, this winter. Uh, I believe I heard that we haven't had a one day below zero in January, uh, but that's going to come to an end uh, by the end of the week. Uh, thankfully, it's a short uh, period of time. We're going to have this extreme weather, uh, but I've asked them to uh, check in with their, their folks uh, and their agencies and departments uh, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect the most vulnerable. And, uh, and advocating for anything we can do to protect your pets and so forth, any advice we can do to get through that two, two to three days. And lastly, a lot of the folks from the CUDs in the state um, that have helped expand broadband and are, are continuing to do so, many of them starting construction um, and already have. What is your, your take on, on all the work that they've done? Um, obviously, there's a, a resolution in the House today just recognizing them and, yeah, we got a, you know, I appreciate every, all the effort uh, from them. A lot of them are just community groups, volunteers, and so forth. Um, so um, I very much appreciate that, uh, but we have a long ways to go. And uh, we need to be able to, to measure that uh, with metrics to see how we're doing, and I'm not sure where we're at with that either. So um, I think, uh, uh, again, we've advocated, and we've been able to, as a group with the legislature, uh, put a lot of money towards this, and appropriately so, and we'll just have to make sure that we follow through to make sure that we're getting everything we need out of this so that we are connected in the future for our economy and the rural parts of our state as well. And I guess last quickly on that, Governor, what, what do you think Vermonters' expectations should be of connecting the last mile, right? We, we heard this morning we're about halfway through getting everybody, and we're about halfway there, and it's going to take substantial investment going yeah. forward. So the, last, the last mile is always the most difficult. Uh, I remember uh, having these uh, conversations in the debate, uh, in the gubernatorial debate uh, a few years ago, 
and I said, you know, it's, nothing's free, um, and it's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars to accomplish this. And that was back in those, uh, you know, 2017 dollars. Um, so it's gotten more expensive uh, today. So I said, it's like four or five hundred mile, a million dollars, and we're going to need uh, some help on the federal end to accomplish this. So we got the, the help from uh, the feds on this uh, using these uh, federal dollars, and uh, the legislature uh, worked with us uh, to, to make sure that we appropriated that in the right way, and they had a lot of great ideas as well. And um, so I, I have a feeling uh, that we're going to get to a point where we still aren't um, to the last mile. Uh, because it's, uh, it's just very expensive, very difficult to do. But at that point, uh, who knows what the technology <laughs> will bring forth, and maybe they'll, be, um, maybe they'll perfect more satellite um, um, provisions for broadband uh, to connect, but time will tell. We've, we've still got a few years to go before we get to that point. We've got a couple folks on the phone. We'll start with um, Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Ed Barber? Hello? Go. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, uh, my question uh, it involves the, uh, the uh, auto industry with this uh, massive transformation over to uh, electric vehicles. Is the uh, administration taking steps to provide uh, education for first responders to know how to handle a burning battery or extract a person from a car without being electrocuted, and is there going to be any uh, change in curriculum in uh, career centers for uh, students taking automotive classes yeah. to be able to familiarize themselves with batteries? I'll take the last part first. Uh, we've been working with our CTEs uh, throughout the state and trying to develop programs to get ready uh, for this involvement to to electric vehicles, and uh, obviously, I'm, I've been an, an advocate uh, for this change and this this uh, this uh, new frontier, so to speak. Uh, and we're going to learn a lot along the way. Uh, in terms of um, of fi firefighters, uh, yes, I mean that there is a lot of talk about that, and there will be more as we move forward um, on how to safely. Uh, Put out any uh, fires that might uh, might develop, um, and in terms of electrocution, I'm not sure that they're going to be any any more uh, dangerous than an average vehicle that are some in some ways electrified now. Uh, so I don't think that'll be any different. What was the other part of the question, Ed? Uh, just uh, getting it into the career centers because it's not just a matter of reading a book. There's got to be some money invested to get a, an EV vehicle, you know, on site for the students to get their hands on. Yeah, we um, we have been uh, trying to promote that. Uh, obviously, with the supply chain issues, uh, it's been d difficult to to get as many vehicles as we we need uh, to meet the demand. Um, but uh, but that'll come uh, soon enough with ships and so forth. And uh, as well with uh, with batteries themselves, and and that's going to be a challenge for us as a uh, as a country. Where do we get the materials uh, for the batteries, and are we going to build them ourselves, or are we going to rely on other countries to supply them? Uh, I would much rather have them uh, on our own soil and uh, make sure that we're producing them here. Uh, but that's going to be a national discussion, I believe. Thank you very much. Thanks. Wilson Ring, DAP. Uh, hi, Governor. Um, just a follow-up on the, uh, the discussion you were having, you were having earlier about the end of the COVID emergency. Um, there aren't any emergency or any restrictions left over here in Vermont, are there? I don't think so, but I don't want to say I know everything. And then secondly, how do you think, almost three years since the start of the emergency, how do you think Vermont's response was? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. Is there's any restrictions at this point? We ended our state of emergency um, over a year ago, year maybe a year and a half ago. Um, so that was. Uh, it's been quite some time. Um, in terms of our response, uh, 
I think we did as well as could be expected uh, through the help of uh, many Vermonters and their attitude and, and trying to take the politics out of it. And so we, we got through it successfully, uh, certainly uh, with the appropriations from Congress, with uh, Senator Leahy, uh, uh, Senator um, Sanders and Congressman Welch. Uh, they brought uh, our share, more than our share in some respects, uh, to Vermont in terms of relief dollars, and that's going to be essential that we, uh, we continue uh, to make sure that we're investing that money into the future and get us uh, through this last inflationary period. So I think we did, uh, we did well uh, in, in terms of in relationship and in comparison to other states and uh, very proud of what we accomplished together in doing so. Thank you very much. Any others in the room?